like to start by acknowledging the Aboriginal people as traditional custodians of the land on which we're all gathered today, wherever we are in Australia. I extend my respect to Elders past, present and emerging of all Aboriginal nations, and I respect and uphold their vital and continuing connection to land, air, waters, culture and all living things. I'm on the land of the Kulin Nation. Uh, so if you could just introduce yourself in the chat and tell us what land you're joining us from today. Great way to practice the chat function. And I'll read them out, Judith, because I know you're in presenter mode. So I'll let you know where everybody's coming to us from. All right, we've got Kara from Wurundjeri, Shalani also from Wurundjeri. Uh, Fiona joining us from Gunai Kurnai country. That's out your way, Judith. Yes, it is. Erin from Bundjalung. Oh, that's on the Gold Coast. Hayden, who's in the inner west of Melbourne, also Wurundjeri, Gubby Gubby country. Fantastic. Thank you to all those people who have said hello and where they're coming from today. So now that we've all practiced using that chat function, I'll just remind you again that you'll be able to pop your questions in there throughout the presentation. So we've got just a brief hour together this afternoon for Stories of Sustainability. It's a project that's part of the Education for Sustainability Starts with Teachers project that's funded by the Victorian government. And so I give my thanks to uh, all the EVE staff in their support of this project, to the Committee of Management for, and uh, to my colleagues for bringing this event together. So this series is an opportunity for teachers to hear stories of sustainability and environmental learning and to share in that learning. And this afternoon, we're gonna dive into our second of the school stories. And we're joined this afternoon by Judith Stewart, who comes from Luana College, which is in Newbra. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Victoria, that's out in the Latrobe Valley. Uh, in this session, we're gonna find out about the Wicking Garden system that was established at Luana College and some of the amazing features, which include an orchard, a butterfly garden, uh, and an indigenous food garden. We'll also hear about uh, Judith's experience with that fabulous thing that we all like doing, grant, uh, grant applications. Uh, and we're gonna learn a little bit more about how the garden functions at that secondary school. And so to give you a little bit of information about Judith, she's a science teacher and the Resource Smart Schools Coordinator at Loana College in Newbro. And she's the winner of Resource Smart Schools Secondary Teacher of the Year Award this year. And some of the programs that Judith has organised are the Green Tradies with the assistance of three community volunteers who help students to plant, harvest, cook and cook healthy and fresh food. And the Leadership for Sustainability program with 15 enthusiastic students who learn about different leadership styles, open decision making, integrity and living plastic free. And Judith has also begun studying a postgraduate certificate of sustainable business at Cambridge UK. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Judith, and I'll keep an eye on the chat. So if anybody has any questions, they can pop them in there. But yeah, looking forward to hearing your story this afternoon. Thanks, Dominique. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak. Um, so what I have is, as you suggested, I've got a slideshow for you, and this is going to be about um, talking to you about the value of applying for Save as they Ed Sustainability Prize and the other grants that I've applied for. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about specifically about the Leadership and Sustainability Program, how that was developed and the benefits that I think that we've gotten out of that as well as the community. Um, I've also included in the slides a little bit about our agriculture and horticultural program because that is um, uh, symbiotic with the sustainability program in the garden. So I'm going to link that in as well. Um, and as you mentioned, I'll also be talking about the indigenous food culture and food garden that we've got and the butterfly garden and an aquaponic system that we have installed. And um, we've got a few other, I've got some proposed projects um, on the go that I would like to talk about as well. So. Um, I will make a start if that's okay. So, all right, so um, myself and a student and a parent, when we were winners of the Zayed Sustainability Prize, or should say finalists for that, it felt like winning, I can tell you, because we got to go to Abu Dhabi and there was free flights, free food, free accommodation. And we spent a week in Abu Dhabi um, sightseeing. But the best bit about it all was the um, going to see the world class sustainability exhibition. And that in itself was worth it, not just for myself, but also for the student and the parent, 
because they had things there that were so new, they weren't even on the market yet. So concepts of sustainability that I hadn't seen before. And one of those, and I'll talk about that later if you're interested, one of the ones that I picked up was the Tizo Electricity. So the bridge that they've got over there, um, it's running on vibration electricity, okay? It's through crystals, so next slide. Um, so we were lucky enough to be finalists twice and we got to do a bit of sightseeing and go to Ferrari World, which was absolutely amazing. Um, the fastest, fastest, um, I don't know what you call those um, rides, the fastest ride in the world and the one with the biggest and longest dip in the world. And I had to go on that. It took me about an hour before I could walk again after that. And you, oh, and you're not allowed to wear your shoes, right? Because your shoes would come off during the ride. So you're not allowed to wear your shoes during the ride. Okay, so now then, the Zayed Sustainability Prize, it's not an award, okay? This isn't for something, um, you know, like, oh, wow, I've done something really great. This is a grant for innovation or innovative ideas, okay? Um, and if anybody's interested in doing it, I would be happy to support you. But they've actually got all the previous winners applications online and you can look at them and you think, all right, so it seems to be that the people who've won have come up with something that's new, okay? So everyone that I saw came up with something that was new and different. So it's not about how good your school is. So it doesn't go to the top schools. And I would certainly not put our school in, in that category. We wouldn't say that we were the top school anywhere, okay? Um, so there's lots of benefits in, in applying for it because this is actually what drove me to sort out all of the programs, all of the programs that we've got at Luana, I got um, through being involved in the sustainability prize application. Okay, there was a couple of little bits that, that weren't part of it, but most of them were. So I think it was a really valuable, um, a really valuable activity. Okay. Um, so we are, we have, in fact, as far as I know, we are the only school that has a, um, a Wiccan Garden program, so that's number two, but and our Leadership for Sustainability program. We've had them in the past, but we've never had a Student Leadership for Sustainability program. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So, the other thing that we have is an outdoor classroom. And um, this is all about cooking with fresh vegetables, like um, Dominic was saying, um, harvesting, cooking, fruit, the vertical wall aquaponics system, and uh, sustainability innovation number four, proposed solar panels and LED lighting. I worked out that if we had, if we put on, um, I think it would cost us 450,000, because we've got a fairly big school, that we could pay that off out of the savings in five years and that over the life of the panels which so if you buy panels that are guaranteed for 25 years that would save us two million dollars okay it will save the government two million dollars um, and currently i believe they have programs to put solar in schools and normally you'd think okay so there is no other than being a sustainable benefit for the environment which is great the school doesn't actually get the money. You just, you save money, but then because you're being funded by the government, but you don't get it. Well, the new system says that you get half of what you save. So at the moment, um, so somebody else might be able to correct me on that, but at the moment, I believe it's really worthwhile. So right now is a good time to apply if you, if you can do that. Um, Another sustainable innovation that we have at our school. So our technology section are building solar model cars and biodigester models, um, which is really 
it's a really valuable demonstration, okay? So for kids may never ever see this stuff anywhere else. Um, so in just, just knowing that it exists is good for future, for their future when they've left school. Um, we ran a program for uh, innovative energy production and we had a bicycle powered smoothie maker at the school. Kids absolutely loved it, right? So this actually took up probably 90% of their time and their interest was making the smoothie. So getting on the bike and making the smoothie. But out of that, I can say that that's a really, really positive thing because they now know that the, there is more than one way to make a smoothie and, and if they ever need to, I've got kids that are interested in the technology side of it and they would be willing to make their own. That's how much they enjoyed it. So they want to go away, they've got, they think, oh, I've got a bike. Oh, I could do that. Okay, so it's setting, setting concepts in motion in the heads of these young people. Judith, we've just had a really good question from the audience. Sure. Um, can you give us a bit of context, contextual information about the school, about the size and the number of students, a little bit about the community that you're situated in? Okay. Um, we run around about 1,000 students. It's secondary school going from year seven through to year 12. It's based in the Latrobe Valley, which is right in the middle of the coal-fired power station. Um, so there are, oh, well, there were, there are three, three coal-fired power stations here still. The fourth one has just been shut down, which is Hazelwood. And we have um, probably 50% of parents on, um, um, on the door, actually, here. So out of work because of all those issues around the power stations and the loss of work. So um, you might understand that given that being the case, uh, there's not a lot of support from parents in relation to sustainability. So anything that, that we do at the school, if we call it sustainability, it's actually, um, they find it, a lot of kids find it offensive because they see that as being the means of shutting down their parents' jobs. Okay, um, now did, that, did I answer your question? You sure did. Yeah, absolutely. Challenging context. Yeah, very much so. All right. So our Leadership for Sustainability program, um, part of that program, we ran an outward bound snow camp. All I can say is just wow. Like for me, it was a challenge. And um, for the kids, what they got out of it. Um, so they learned about living energy free right so they were um so they had to make their own make their own or make their own food they all was cut up by themselves no machines no no microwave no ovens no anything so it was all um cooked on fire um cut up all by themselves and cut up under candle light so absolutely minimum amount of energy used and available um they also learned about different leadership styles Okay, that um, supportive leadership, peer leadership. Um, um, so there were, there was four main types of leadership that we went through. But more important than that, I thought, was the discussion about open leadership. So when you're making decisions about something, tell people why you're doing it and how it's going to be done and who's going to be involved so that other people get the chance to understand and feel as though they have an input and in fact, give them the input if you need to. So, so big discussion around about around the open integrity of leadership and about communication that's required. Um, we also had courage development and risk management activities. And as you can see in the photo, some resilience development. Our Leadership for Sustainability program has done other things as well. So we, I also um, organised for the students to attend the Australian Youth Climate Coalition in 2017 and we did that again last year. Um, 
Now that itself, I would recommend that. It's two, two days of activity and it tells the students everything about what sustainability is, what climate change is, all of the effects that it's having and ways that they can work around that and how the community can work around it. So it's not just school, it's home, um, it's the environment, it's the community. It's, that's a really valuable program. So you can see our guys got on board, so holding up their banner, Climate Justice for the Latrobe Valley. Okay, so the next slide is about our sustainability and recycling programs that we have at the school. So, and I would say that most schools probably have this anyway. So the recycling, um, our aluminium cans, we actually donate to the, uh, to our local scout group, right? So the scout leaders come and collect the cans and then take them directly to, um, to be um, uh, recycled. Okay, so then they get money for it. So rather than having to be removed by the council out of the waste, so it's a, um, it's cutting down, cutting down on energy use here. Um, and we also recycle print cartridges and food scraps and mobile phones. And if you have a look over at the picture on the other side, the milk bottles, we had, um, we asked parents and students to donate milk bottles to the school so that when we put our wicking gardens together, the milk bottles have holes in the bottom of them, by the way, the milk bottles are used as a reservoir. So the sand goes over the top of the milk bottles and then there's spelt over the top of that and then the soil goes in. But in the bottom, in the bottom is the milk bottles that are being reused, okay? And Further on, we'll talk about the, the value of those gardens. So um, some people some people would perhaps be concerned about the use of the plastic. So we actually are using reservoir plastic, so it's food grade. Okay, um, now this little bit, it's an awful lot to read, and I suggest that you don't read it if you're not interested. If you're interested in Bokashi composting, please just do a screenshot. Okay, I'll give a brief rundown. Um, I use Bokashi composting, composting at home. It's anaerobic, it's fermentative. And I learned about it probably about four or 10 years ago. And I heard, and I went and, and learned about it because I heard that it produced the best soil in the world, okay? And it is regenerative. So, some of the some of the countries that use this type of composting, they have not just they don't just do the composting. They also put in things like um, um, coal or coal shards from from their fires. They might put in bits of broken um, broken ceramics, things like that. So, a combination of these things all combine to include nutrients plus water holding capacity plus the right pH. Um, so and you can you can get the tubs now from Bunnings and you can get the Bokashi spray from Bunnings. So you couldn't when I started but you can now and very cheap and when I put it in my compost bin, I I take it from the Bokashi bin and then I put it straight in my compost bin to finish finished composting. I have never seen so many worms in my life. Like you could actually put your hand into my compost bin and like lift up a handful of worms. They love it. So don't be frightened of putting it into your composting. It, it's really effective and yet I wouldn't go back and compost the other way at all ever. It's, it's amazing. Judith, can I ask, how do you manage it at school? Like uh, how many bins or, and how are the students involved and all of that? Okay, so we've got, see the little food scrap bin up the top, right? 
So we've got those in the main in the staff rooms, and then we've got some non like as in the Bakashi, we've got buckets in the corridors for the junior school and the senior school. We don't have it in the middle school. We trialled it in the middle school, uh, except that there were some big issues with that. Middle school just didn't seem to understand what they were meant to do with it. And we had like there was food scraps all over the place and then they're putting rubbish in there. And so because I'm the one, I'm the, actually the one who is emptying them, right? Because um, the, the school garden is a fair way away and um, it wasn't working when the kids were doing it. It was causing some problems. So it ended up just being me. That's an unfortunate thing. I'd like to, I would really like to see the students to be on board, to be a part of that. So now, did I answer your question? You did. And we just had an interesting share from the audience that from bitter experience, love Bakashi, but I didn't assemble the tap properly. It leaked into my kitchen drawer and the smell lingered for ages. My fault. <laughs> Yep. Um, so, well, actually, now that is a good point. So I've got one of those, those same Bakashi um, tubs with the tap on the bottom, and I had exactly the same problem at least. So I fixed up the, the, the tap myself. I put a bit of different washer on it, but I have it sitting in a tub now. So if it ever leaks again, I won't ever have that same problem. And actually, compared to other normal compost, it doesn't smell anywhere near as bad. And the um, the Bikashi spray isn't too bad at all. It's actually quite I quite like the smell of the Bikashi spray. A bit like a, a nice wine, <laughs> something like that. Our fermentation. Yes, you've got it. Okay. Um, so something else that our leadership and sustainability students did, we ran a whole school energy audit. Due to COVID, we got halfway through. However, so what the students looked at was um, room temperatures, light levels, draft for clients' energy use, um, heaters, fans, and more importantly, turned off a, um, sorry, installed, pasted on the teacher's desk, please turn off the lights and fan signs. And as you can see, this very gentle reminder to turn off the lights and the fans when you leave, this can have a huge impact. Okay? Because I, because I'm part of the Ag Court program, um, the agricultural side of things, I'm at the school, I go check at the animals at eight o'clock at night. And when I turn up there, I was finding that the lights were still on at eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night. That's an extra five hours of energy wasted. So basically, if we're paying, um, we'll just say, I know we pay more, but just say it was 100,000 a year. Um, we are actually paying 40,000 extra a year. But we're paying more, by the way. So we'd be paying 40,000 40, extra per year for electricity because these lights are being left on. Right? And, and I'm actually saying that it was like 70% of the lights were still on at 8 o'clock at night. That's, that is huge. I've put in, put in suggestions, it's still not, um, well, I'll keep going because nobody's listening yet. Okay, now the next um, innovation that we have at our school is um, something called SWEP. And I can't even remember what this stands for, but you can just go online, you can Google it, and the membership is around $150 for three years. What they do, they come to your school and they will put a, um, a digital water meter on your water supply. We've got two water feedings for our school, so they've got one on each. And then they monitor your water usage. And so you can see down the bottom, this sort of graph that they get. And so what I've got, what I've sent to you is, this is an, a water wastage alert. So it's saying the SWEP system detected water losses at our school overnight and it's saying that we're losing 300 litres at a go, right? So this system, I would highly recommend, when we first put it on, 
I, I organized for it to be put on because I thought I had seen, whoops, I'm gonna go back again. I thought I'd seen a rise in the cost of our water use. And it looked like it had gone up at almost double. And I thought that's a bit weird, because that was when I first took on the, um, the sustainability coordinator cost um, position. So anyway, um, after we put in this, this program and they came, they found a huge leak and we ended up saving about $10,000 in a year. Okay, so I cannot recommend this enough. They're, they're on the ball, they know what they're doing and you get a warning every time you've got a leak. So it's, it's saved a huge amount of water. Okay. Yeah. Just to let everybody know, SWEP is the school's water efficiency program. Um, it's available to schools in Victoria through your uh, local water provider. So um, I don't know what they are all called across the state, but it's worth finding out if you are um, eligible to be part of the project, particularly if you're in Victoria. I'm not sure if there are equivalents across Australia. I haven't investigated that far, but being able to see real-time water data is um, hugely valuable and like Judith said, a great cost saving. Yeah, well, for, for $150 for three years, and it saved us $10,000. I don't think you can go wrong with that. Um, now, the next um, activity that we had at our school that I thought was really valuable, there's a, a gentleman locally who's willing to travel pretty much all over Victoria. His name is Ian Southall, and he has an energy trailer. So in that energy trailer, he's got a whole lot of um, fittings and equipment that are all energy friendly. He comes to the school, he parks it in the school, he gets all of the things out for the kids to have a look at and he talks to them and shows them how they are used. So, and, and then they get the opportunity to play with them and play with them, look at them and ask questions. Uh, absolutely amazing, really a really student friendly um, activity and explained in a way that the students can understand and perhaps probably even the teachers can understand. Another activity that we run at our, that we ran at our school, um, so a previous Zayed Sustainability Ambassador, Toby Fair from Huon Bill in Tasmania, he, um, in fact, I asked him if he would come to our school. He said that he was willing to be a speaker. So he came to our school and he spoke to our year seven to nine students about what a student can do to fight climate change. Now, this is a very passionate young man and very knowledgeable about sustainability. Um, it was a pleasure to have him actually, and he is still a public speaker and available for any school, probably in Australia, I would imagine. Um, so, given that we are in, in Metro Valley, we did have some, some dissent about having a sustainability speaker come to talk to our students. But my thoughts are that here's a young person is showing our students what they can do about sustainability. So, I think on his 18th birthday, I think he was having dinner with the French president talking to him about sustainability. He went to the World Sustainability Expo and conference in Chile, or was it, did it end up going to Spain? I can't remember. But this is one, this is one um, motivational young man, really worth having as a speaker. We also ran a sustainability movie for our year seven and eight. This is an end of year program. I hadn't actually seen it before we ran it, which is a little bit, a little bit sad because it turns out it's more like a document, <coughs> sorry, more like a documentary than a movie. Right? So um, if you were going to promote it, and I do think it was valuable, if you're going to promote it, I would say, say to the students that it was a documentary. Um, and I would get them to look for all of the things that that come up in the movie about what we can do about uh, climate change. The best thing about it is that it actually gives kids hope 
for the future instead of being frightened and hearing all of the bad things, you know, the world's going to be gone and we're going to die. Well, no, not if we do something about it. Okay, so I thought this was a really valuable movie. Um, now then, what our school has done to make changes about sustainability. This actually took me five years to get this tiny little bit in, in our green purchasing policy. And basically what, what we suggested or what I've suggested here is that instead of just considering finances, that they also consider social and environmental impact of the goods that they purchase. Okay, so that's maybe five words, but that is huge. That is huge. And if other schools can do that, it doesn't mean that every time that you want to buy something that you're going to be able to um, ignore, the, ignore the cost and consider the environment, but at least you have that option. Okay, now then, this slide is about the, um, going back to 2013, I won uh, as runner-up teacher of the year, but that's not what was, what's important. The, the reason that I got that, got the runner-up award was because of the, um, the innovation that I, I created a sustainable fuel experiment for our students. So it was ethanol fuel from potato. And I've got the recipe on the next slide. Now, the best thing about this is, I don't know if anybody knows about ethanol being made from potato. I, I, unfortunately, I can't see any faces or anything like that. So basically, we're making vodka. Okay, so basically we're making vodka. And um, I talked to the kids about the alcohol and the ethanol in that. And I have the recipe here. So if anybody's interested in running this sort of an experiment, here's the recipe, do a screenshot. And um, so ethanol fuel is being used in South, South Africa, I think. They've got um, cars running on there and they're making it over there as well. So, um, so this is, and I, I'm, I'm imagining that everybody that's on board here is very sustainable minded. My thoughts around this of using ethanol as a fuel is that if we create it from the soil, we can return it to the soil, if that makes sense. So we're, we're, growing, we're growing the potatoes, we're making the fuel. Yes, we do, when we burn it, we do create CO2, but it is returnable once we grow our next crop. Does that make sense? So I consider that to be reasonably sustainable as opposed to using um, um, coal-based, coal oil-based, gas-based fuels that are you know, 15 million years old and we can't return them. Not for another 15 million years anyway. Okay, so the recipe for the ethanol fuel three kilos of potatoes, kilo of sugar, um, water to cover the potatoes while you're boiling, and that is just normal bread maker's yeast. Wash your potatoes, and um, once you've boiled them, vitamise it, allow it to cool first before you put the yeast over the top, and then you just need to keep that in a reasonably um, warm setting, and you can do that with a light, you know, one of those heat lamps, so that would work. So just set it up with a heat lamp, with a, um, uh, on your bucket, cover your, your bucket, and and in two weeks' time, then you distill it at 78.4 degrees. Have to make sure that you distill it at the at that temperature. If you were going to drink it, right? So if people were drinking it as vodka, it has to be distilled at that temperature to get the ethanol, because other alcohols can be made. So and I don't know if you know about about the accidents that have happened in Bali where methanol was produced. This should not have methanol in it because it doesn't have wood in it. But other alcohols are present. Okay. Um, 
Sorry, yeah. Judith, we've got a question about the uh, ethanol. How much do you, what volume of um, ethanol do you get out of that recipe? Okay. Um, okay, that is a good question because I've never distilled the whole thing. I've only ever, I've used it to prove to the students that you're making ethanol and because um, it takes a little bit of time to do the distillation. So now then, so I'm just thinking about the volume. I would say about 10%. So if you've got two litres, two litres of water and maybe like two kilos, so you've got about four kilos, maybe, mm, it's also, what would that be, 40 grams? Something like that? Yeah, so that? good for demonstration purposes. Yeah, well, I haven't done it very thoroughly, but it's, it's a proof, it's a proof process, if that makes sense, proving to the kids that it exists. Yep, great, yep. thank okay. you. There could be more, I really don't know actually. So I'd, I'd look at that, look into it a bit more if somebody really wanted to know. Um, now then, the Green Tradies Program. So the Wicking Garden system that we've set up is done in, in, in conjunction with a program where we have one day a week, we have three, um, three community volunteers come to the school and they work with about 30 to 40, um, 40, 30, 40 students, about five or six students per lesson, right, six, seven, they said maximum of seven, they don't want any more than that, can't handle it. So now these students that are going out to work in the garden are considered to be either at risk or disengaged. Now, these students are becoming highly interested in the gardening and to the point where they wanted to come to this, they wanted to put in for the prize, for the gardening prize and see that the four students that have attended there, they are absolutely, absolutely stoked to be there with Costa Gorgiari. Okay. Um, other other activities that we've run, tree planting day. I don't think anybody needs any information about that. We all know they exist. All right, now, our ag court study. The agricultural side of things, we are attempting to, to base this on permaculture. Sorry, I'm just losing my voice. Okay, so talking to the students about increasing um, tree use, about the mini water cycle, um, about that helping to maintain grass levels. And we've got a farm who does this locally, who no longer need to produce hay. Okay, because you've got the trees there, because you've got the water there all year round, um, and so you don't need to produce the hay or the special cropping. So that reduces the impact of farming on the environment big time. Okay, um, the information about the ag studies, we've discovered that when we run the animal programs, we've had some students, because ag, by the way, has a tendency to get kids who are interested in animals, but are disengaged. And so we've had the attendance go from 30 up to 80% during the animal program. Um, and can I say that we are, the jobs in the dairy industry, are getting higher and higher. So I looked at the website yesterday, 443 jobs available. And um, so sustainable farming is becoming the new sexy. Okay. So um, ag court studies again, we've got the chicken and the hen manure going into the compost and the sawdust is recycled from the woodwork woodwork rooms. We've got a lot of people involved in running our programs. And this is in a way, I guess, I don't know whether that interests you, but it's relevant because all of these, all of these staff are involved in, because they're involved in the program, they're involved in sustainability because 
the manure that we produce from these calves is then going into the composting and then going into the gardening. And then, so excuse me, just one moment, um, please, I'm having trouble hearing. Um, so, um, so now, so it's going into um, feeding the calves and the hay instead of grain and therefore reducing the rear end methane house gases. Ah, my, one of my favourite topics. So we've also installed a, an indigenous plant butterfly garden. So I've, I've put down in the pictures, I've listed the ones that we have installed, right? So we've put in Banksia, we've put in Grevillea, we've put in Veronia, and I can't even pronounce the other thing, but it's on the label. So it's a, a Hemolusian, I think. Somebody else might be able to, to tell me the right way to say that. On me. However, the the components of an indigenous butterfly garden, we need to have rocks, okay, and we also need to have access to water. And it's better if the water and the rocks are right side by side. Okay, so sand would also be effective if there was water there and available. Um, now, in this picture, you can see. The Wicking Gardens. So we're standing right next to the Wicking Gardens. <clears throat> the kids, the students have also made barrel Wicking Gardens. And if you're interested in knowing how to do that, uh, you can look on the ABC Gardening um, site. And the search word that I would use would be Alice Springs because Costa Georgiatis got got the students to make them in Alice Springs. So when I saw that, um, I got my, my students to make them. So those, my students made all of those blue ones. They used the special saws to cut out the shapes and butterflies and make little pictures on them. And the students also contributed to making some of the Wicking Gardens, not all of them. It actually took such a long time. It was over a period of about three years. And we ran out of time, so I had to get somebody in to finish it off. But in the background, what I wanted you to see was the fact that we have now got an outdoor, an outdoor classroom. So right behind me is the outdoor classroom. And so we've got some, some fairly rustic cooking facilities in there. And we've got a sink and a table. And that is where the students are doing their food preparation and any of the learning that they're doing. Not doing potting and mixing and things like that. That's where they're doing their food preparation. So they're collecting the fresh food and then um, cooking it in there and then eating. Okay, another of my absolutely, yeah, I get so, so engrossed with this. <clears throat> so, Indigenous Plant Food Garden. Now, I've got a little bit of a story, a very short one to tell you. I, I spent about $1,500 on Indigenous food plants. Um, three years ago, and a year later, I think we had about um, $100 worth of those left, okay? Now, the reason is that most people, students and staff in, and volunteers included, nobody of those recognised the plants, right? and considered that, oh, well, that's not, that doesn't look like a spinach, that doesn't look like a tree. The strawberry gum that I had, which is, you know, really, really special, strawberry gum, you take the leaves off, it's the only tree, only gum tree that doesn't have eucalyptus in the leaves, and you use that for flavouring in cakes and um, cakes and ice cream, for example. It tastes halfway between passion fruit and strawberry. Anyway, so it got ripped out because someone thought a gum tree was growing there right in our garden. Um, a lot of the other stuff got mowed over because they didn't recognise it. So I'll give you a warning now. You need fences around this stuff and you need really, really clear labels to tell people what it is. Otherwise you're going to lose it. Right? So it's um it's a really interesting experience. So now that I've been through it, uh, this will save you a bit of money hopefully. Now the other thing is the um, 
so I'm interested in promoting Indigenous um, culture and native plants and that goes along with native feed. So I'm already looking at um, building some native feed boxes. We've got a local, the local men's shed has got, uh, what would you call them? Um, like they're setting up kits to put these feed boxes together. So I'm, uh, depending on COVID and how that all works, um, I reckon I reckon I could still I could send these out to the kids and they could do it if if we don't get back to school. So we're still I'm still planning on having it done. Okay, yeah. So the next like all of that stuff that I've done out in the garden basically was building it and setting up setting up ready for this program. The program is proposed, it hasn't been installed yet. So just one second. Right, so what I want to do is run a program all year round in the school garden and have just say if you look at the students in one class, they will go out to the garden say five times a year and just one hour on that each time they go out for one year, one hour. Sorry. And what that means is that so one period per term roughly is what they would spend out in the garden. So I'm proposing that having that one period per term over the three, three to four years is going to be more valuable than doing one week in year seven or one week in year ten. Okay, so I want the kids, I want the students to be involved in the garden, to see the progress, to do the planting, to see the growing, to see the harvesting, and then to get involved in collecting the seeds. Okay, so if you run that something like that over a week, it's pretty tricky to get to get the buy-in, to get the students to be engrossed, to see the outcomes, right? So with this program, not only do they do the planting, then they do the harvesting, they've got to also do the caring for it. So I'm wanting them to create a habit. And that habit is to be about backyard, backyard gardening, okay? This is to cut down the food miles. I, just, just very recently, I mean, I know that 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 um, carting food is can be expensive, but I heard how many kilometres that it that it took to get uh, one apple or something, and I just thought it's not just bringing it from Queensland; it's also all of the fuel and so on that's being used up there. So, if we can have the students grow their own food in their own backyards. It cuts down all of that. It cuts away all of the excuses and all of the reasons for that fuel use. So much more sustainable to have their have them growing their own food. And this is the pro forma. So this has already been set up by a gentleman called Joseph Hader. So and seriously. I was really, really impressed, and this is the reason why I got into this type of gardening in the first place. So this is just a local gentleman who has set up uh, gardens in a couple of primary schools, and ours was the first secondary school. So he has set up a, a program, what's being planted in what week, and he's also set up a list of jobs. So that you put the names of the students down the side, and then each time they go out into the garden over this um, three year period, they, they know what their job is. Okay, so this is already set up in advance. So each time they go out, they've got a different job and the teachers get to explain it. So it's not just the students that learn how to do this, the teachers will be learning as well. So it, this could be an English teacher going out there to learn, um, to learn and to show. It could be a math teacher going out there to learn and to show how to do it. And it's just all written down. The, see, I'm not a gardener, right? Nobody would know just because Miss Judy Stewart has 
being involved and got these prizes. I didn't know anything about gardening, right? This guy, Joseph Hader, showed me this program and it works. So I'm happy to show, I'm happy to share any of these, um, um, the documents and the, the templates and so on, if anybody's interested. Okay, so um, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to present and I hope you found some relevance and some value in this for your own school program. And um, yeah, thank you very much guys. And if there's any questions, I'm happy, happy to answer. Excellent. Thanks very much, Judith. That was a fabulous overview of all the um, amazing things that you're doing at the school. And we do have a couple of questions. Yep. Um, first of all, some people were saying they, yes, please, would love that information about the planting. Did you say with Joseph Hader about how you're going to manage the program? Yes. Yep. People would definitely love to see that resource. Yep. Uh, and we do have a question. So when you presented the school's green purchasing policy, uh, one yes. of the participants, Shalani, asked if she minded, if you minded if she included that information in her own school's green purchasing policy, the, mm -hmm. reason, the different things to consider. Oh, yes. Yeah. Say so, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Um, have you seen the impact of that purchasing policy yet? Is it is it uh, operational yet for the school? Um, it was voted in by the school committee, so it's been accepted. In terms of of the impact, no one has come to me yet to say, "Oh, look, the school has said yes, I could do this before when it was going to cost this much." So no, no one has said anything, but it doesn't mean that it isn't working. It just means that that option is now available. Yep. Yeah, yeah great. Well, thank you very much for that. Oh, uh, we have a question from Gwen. What are animal duties? And she also wants the, the templates, but she wants to know what the animal duties are on that roster. Okay, so, um, so you will have noticed that we have, or that we keep chickens or hens at the school. And we also have calves at the school. So when we talk about animal duties, that is um, collecting, uh, or you can do feeding, feeding the hens, and collecting the manure, collecting the eggs, that sort of thing. Um, the calves are specifically for the egg study, so we don't have anybody else dealing with them. But that would be then feeding, feeding the calves, collecting the manure. But um, Joseph told me that um, the other schools that he has worked at, they have had um, rabbit hutches and they used the rabbit manure. They've had chickens and they've had guinea pigs. So if you're having, if you're having the extra animals, then the animals have to be fed and the animals have to be cleaned and looked after. So that's what the animal duty is. Great, so great to see that as part of the rotation. That's fantastic. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah wonderful. Yeah, um, if I may say one, just one thing. Yeah, of course. So Joseph Hader's garden, right, the significance of that is that he focuses on the compost, right? So everything in his garden setup is around building the compost. And then once you've got collected all of the food waste from the, from the school, from the staff rooms and the school kitchens and the waste from the students, lunchtime and recess, that's supposed to be going into the compost. And then that compost is going back onto the garden. So he, I like that because that's, that is proving, proving the cycle of life, that is proving the sustainability side of it. Okay, so sorry, I just thought I'd add that now. Please finish. Yeah, fabulous. Um, and it is, it's the foundation really of a good garden, good soil. So mm. you start with yeah. setting up your soil by creating compost, setting yourself up for a successful garden. Yeah. Yeah, fabulous. Uh, so I think I've covered all the questions that popped up in the chat. Uh, there's some great resources that have been shared and, oh, hang on. Yep, so we've got lots of thanks coming in from people um, and we might wrap it up there. So thank you very much again, Judith, for your um, sharing of the exciting and interesting work that you're doing at your school. And thank you everybody for coming along this afternoon. We have another session next week with Jack Dunstan, who's running an urban farm right in the middle of Footscray. So those of you who are familiar with Melbourne, uh, mm. Footscray is right smack bang in the heart of urban Melbourne. And uh, they've got a site there where they are running a, um, a fairly similar actually to what you're doing, Judith, 
mm -hmm. uh, an urban urban ag program for the students there and so Jack's going to take us on a tour of the school next week so if you haven't registered yet you can still sign up for that session yeah and I'll say thank you to everybody again for coming along this afternoon and hope you all enjoy your week and I'll see you next week I'll just read out the thanks Judith as people um, depart so thanks Judith um, so many great projects and initiatives the students are immersed in. I can imagine many of them would be very proactive about various climate change sustainability issues and concerns as a result. Um, lots of requests, yes please, they'd love the templates. Uh, some comments about native bee hotels not quite working out as, as they were planned. Mm -hmm. And uh, from Cara, thank you, it's been very inspiring. So yeah, thanks again, Judith. You're welcome to stay and I will just um, wrap up the session.